people who think face special pitfalls of their own. Thinking can make people feel superior and the arrogance of superiority can make them think that they have no needs like other people. The examined life is in fact demanding. It is the enemy of all mindless conventions, all tired cliches, and all foregone conclusions. The pursuit of an examined life calls for the firm grasp of reason, an honest awareness of conscience, and a living sense of wonder. Oh yeah, that's page 35 of The Great Quest, an invitation to an examined life and a sure path to meaning by Oz Guinness. And guess what? Oz Guinness is on the show. Oz Guinness 2.0. Oz, how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Very well. Thanks for having me back on again. A real privilege. Awesome. I'm so excited for this. We're going to have a great time. And this is for everyone that thinks and wants to explore the meaning of life. So welcome to this episode. Oz, I have your book right here in my hands, The Great Quest. And this is what I'm doing on the show um, lately. I do an emoji reaction to the book. So if you're ready for it, we're going to go and just... Ask the gods of Emojitron what a reaction will be. You ready? <laughs> uh oh, here we go. The gods of Emojitron. What is the great quest emoji reaction we should do today? Right here, we're going to the tombola. And it's the divine emoji reaction. Oz, how do you feel about getting a divine emoji reaction to the great quest? I'm honored. I hope it was the real divine. <laughs> the real divine. I think it is the real divine. Oz, welcome. This is, this is going to be amazing. Your book is just full of examples. And it's an invitation really to a journey. So why don't we just dive right in? If if you know people watching want to listen to our previous episode, just go to Christian Podcast and you can listen. And you know, I introduce you a little bit more to the type of work that you do. Uh, but on this episode, I'm like, we got to talk about stuff on the book and there's so much. So first of all, let's just start right here. What is the goal? What is your purpose? Why were you excited about writing this book? Well, there's so much confusion about the meaning of life. You have philosophers who say it's for madmen and comedians, which is absolutely absurd. Every single one of us wants to make the most of life, and life is incredibly short. So how do we live a life that is worthy of life? You know, Socrates says the unexamined life isn't worth living. But if he's right, there are millions of people who don't think enough, don't care enough to even ask what the meaning of life is. So I've written this book primarily for individual people who want to think it through. Now, of course, we're in an incredible moment. You take the Ukraine war and so on. People are talking civilizationally. What made the West did the West? And you could get into the big things. But my real concern is not the big issues of culture and civilization, but individuals who want to discover the meaning of life. Mm, individuals. Okay, so good. So this is what I want to do on the show, Oz. Um, you're going to bear with me, but I have these emojis, and my idea is can we walk through the five emojis as we walk through the great quest? So... It's going to be so interesting because even as I was reading, I was reading about uh, Salvador Dali and I, like a little funky story you have right there. That I'm like, wow, that's totally like I would put that on like the blasphemous category. 
So let's let's try this. Um, us, if we if we would say what is the most blasphemous idea, like the furthest away from God when it comes to the pursuit of meaning in life, what would you say that is? Well, stories like Salvador Dali. You know, I tell the story there. He had such a bad relationship with his dad that one day he stormed out of the house, went home, masturbated, put his semen in an envelope, took his to his dad and put on the back of the envelope, paid in full. Wow. Now, that, that to me is awful. What a view of life that is. Now, compare that with someone who has an incredible sense of wonder beautiful sunset, a Mozart sonata, or a, watching the birth of a baby, or looking at a flower, you realize life is incredible, but it's amazingly short. So how do we find the meaning that helps us make the most of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Salvador Dali, I mean, I was reading that, and I'm like, Wow, what a what a stretch. I mean, what was he so, I don't know his story, you know, but maybe you can elaborate a little more. Like, was he uh, just in a bad relationship with his dad? Was there, what do you know about the story of Salvador Dali? Well, no, that was the background of that. He had a, an appalling relationship with his father. But as you know, he became a great artist mm. and a surrealist. So people have mm. seen many pictures of the clocks, dripping over the edge of a wall and so on and so on. You know, my wife, before she came to faith, uh, her then fiance, fortunately she didn't marry him, uh, was a friend of Salvador Dali's, so she knew him. In fact, a big turning point in her life was when she was at a party in Salvador Dali's apartment in the Hotel Maurice in Paris. And the whole thing was very surrealistic. You know, women at that time had antlers in their hair, jewel-encrusted, and men with diamond-encrusted Nero jackets and so on. But in the middle of the room in this party, there was Dali's pet cheetah, a painted ocelot, beautiful mm. animal, but it had been declawed, defanged, de-everythinged. And my wife just looking at it, pacing up and down, this beautiful creature, suddenly it struck her as a, terrible caricature of what it was supposed to be. And then she looked at the surrealism of Dali's party guests. She thought, my word, so are we. Mm -hmm. And it was that extraordinary moment that challenged her to become a seeker and mm -hmm. to really start to look for what's the meaning of life. Mm, I love that. Okay, so uh, seeker, I feel like when, when you're a seeker, you're asking questions and... You know, when I was thinking, you know, you said in the book that the rates of suicide are like astonishing, right? And you were even saying, um, let me see if I have it right here. The birth rate is going down in our world, right? So it's almost like this, this, uh, this idea that more people don't have a purpose, more people don't have like a sense of what to live for. And also, less people are, are bringing people to the world. Like, they, they're like, why even bring people, like little kids, to this world that it's, it's hopeless, right? So what would be, maybe, I don't know if, if maybe we can move on to, like, the skeptical emoji, because I, th I think to me that's, that's kind of like the, the one that's asking questions. So what are some of the, the, the good questions we should be asking as thinkers, as people who are finding or trying to find meaning in life. Well, you know, picking up from what you just said, Albert Camus, in his famous book, The Myth of Sisyphus, he starts off, the ultimate question in life is suicide. Mm. And people think, my goodness, that sounds a little depressing. Is he calling people to commit suicide? No, no. He's saying, though, but what is it that makes you want to live? And that will be the thing which stops you dying if you're in a really bad situation. And, of course, that's the meaning of life. And you can see someone like Viktor Frankl in Auschwitz. His challenge was to get people, he called them blanket cases, people who just gave up. So they just stayed in their bunks and died. And he was always trying to get people to have meaning and hope and to have something that would give their life a real point. 
So the first stage in that search for meaning is what I call a time for questions. And it's the questions that constitute and form a real seeker. In other words, we're not talking about channel surfers. We're not talking about hoppers and shoppers, people browsing curiously through a supermarket. We're talking about people for whom life has become a question and they really want an answer. Now, sadly, that's a minority, and I just wish many, many more people were there. Now, the skeptics actually don't help, because the skeptics often raise questions not to get an answer, but to destroy the answers that people have. But we want to get people to start thinking enough, caring enough, to raise the questions that make them look for the meaning of life. Mm, okay. So... Uh, yeah, that's so good. Uh, I was thinking you talk about human reflection versus revelation and worldviews. And you were saying, um, well, it, it just strikes me so interesting that I guess there's a difference between a thinking person, a person that's actually looking for the meaning of life and a person that is not even looking for that. But then the people that are looking for the meaning of life, there's almost like this, this uh, different worldviews in, in which in one there is reflection and in another one is revelation. And you were talking about like um, maybe like these uh, worldviews or maybe even religions. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? The, the human reflection versus the revelation of... I guess, knowledge? Well, a time for questions is what comprises a seeker. But mm -hmm. obviously, someone who has questions is looking for an answer. Now, you can think there was a time people thought we'd find answers in the art world. Hardly any of that today. Or in science. But science tells us about the how questions, not the why. Or maybe philosophy, but philosophy doesn't have many answers after 3,000 years. So the deepest answers come from the big worldviews or the philosophies of life, some of which are religious. Hmm. So as a friend of mine put it, there are three big families of faiths. In other words, faiths that have a common family resemblance because they all go back to the same ultimate source of where everything came from. And if you see it that way, you have the Eastern family, Hinduism, Buddhism, and the New Age movement. You have the secularist family, atheists, agnostics, materialists. And you have the Abrahamic family, which in the West is principally Judaism and the Christian faith. Now, if you compare those, they all have incredibly different answers. But one of the differences is the one you mentioned. So Buddhism is Gautama Buddha's best reflection. Mm. Nothing mm. comes from outside himself. It's his ideas. But so is much of the atheist answer. Someone like Bertrand Russell. You know, he pictured himself as Atlas, the Greek giant, carrying the world of meaning on his own shoulders. He thought it all through for himself. But the difference with the Abrahamic family, Judaism, and the Christian faith, yes, people search, look, examine, use their minds to see the meaning of life. But the answer comes from God meeting us as well as us looking for him. In other words, reason meeting God's revelation. Now, you think of us in friendships. You don't know anyone, a friend to another friend or a wife to a husband, husband to a wife unless you each disclose yourself to the other. If you and I sit in the room for an hour and say nothing, we're not going to know each other. Hmm. But if I share and you share, we'll begin to get to know each other. And that, of course, is the Christian and the Jewish understanding, that God is personal. So he's not just an abstract syllogism or a theory or, or proof. No, no, he's a person. So we've got to get to know him. And he's got to get to know us, and that's how the relationship grows. So you have reason in the search, but you have, crucially, revelation. God discloses himself. 
Mm, okay, that that is amazing, and I feel like as a Christian, I totally get it, right? But if we, you know, if we allow ourselves right now to to stay on like skeptical emoji for a little bit longer, like the questioning, there's also this this sense that some people that think can call faith a crutch, right? So when when you're thinking about reason. And revelation is like we. How do we help people uh, who have questions like move from reason to to the revelation part? If for them maybe just faith is nothing but a crutch. Yeah. Well, that objection comes in in two places, and it's the classic skepticism of say Sigmund Freud or uh, Jean Paul Sartre and people like that. In other words, someone has a question. They become a seeker. They're looking for something. They have a need. And the Freudian jumps in there and says, Ah, I see what you're doing. I have a need, so I believe. Now, mm. that's wrong. No one believes because of a need. What actually happens is they disbelieve what they used to believe. In other words, a mm. question strikes in and shatters what they used to believe, so they need a better belief but they don't know what it is yet. So the need creates the seeker. Now, the second place where the answer comes in is stage three, because someone who has questions, looks for answers. The stage three is, is it true? And that's what answers the objection of a Jean-Paul Sartre or Sigmund Freud. No one should believe in anything because they like it or because they feel good about it, or it works for them. Those are all subjective answers. The only final reason to believe anything properly is that you're convinced it is true. Mm -hmm. And of course, someone who hasn't settled that one, someone who says, I got a problem, Jesus is the answer, I believe. Well, down the line, they'll meet a skeptic, and the skeptic will very easily be able to undermine their faith unless at the proper stage they know what it is to be convinced that it is true. Now, the word truth, unpopular today, but truth is simply a claim about the reality of reality. Mm -hmm. So if, say, the Christian faith is true, it would be true if no one believed it. It would equally be false if everyone believed it, but it wasn't true. So truth is an incredibly important point, and truth is what answers the skepticism of the scoffer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I love that part where you're talking about like truth in today's day and age. I guess I don't know if I, well, when I read scripture, like I feel, you know, there's Pilate talking to Jesus, and he he utters the phrase like "quest es veritas," like what is truth when. Jesus responds to him, you have spoken the truth, right? Or you have spoken truth in regards to Jesus's being, Jesus being the king or being the mm -hmm. owner of the kingdom, right? Um, so uh, nowadays, I mean, you just said, like, what is truth right now? So why are we, well, I guess, I guess I don't want to talk about postmodernism because I feel like that's kind of where it comes from, but there is this question, like how, how, or are people asking the question, is so truth, a, can we you know, know truth? We're in a postmodern age. The Economist magazine had on its cover in 2016, we're in a post-truth age. Now, mm. it goes back a lot longer than 2016. Nietzsche, in the 1880s, he has this radical assault on truth. If God is dead, Truth is dead. Now, there are problems with that. That means if God is dead and truth is dead, all that's left is power. Hmm. So victory goes to the strong and the weak go to the wall. And that's the appalling world that's part of postmodernism. But if you think, so much of our lives absolutely assume and require a strong view of truth. Obviously, science does, because that's why you investigate. You take, say, journalism. If there's no truth, and sadly there isn't all that much in a lot of journalism, all you have is fake news. Hmm. 
And how do you trust the newspaper or the television or whatever? But the same is true in business. Business depends on trust. And trust depends on people who are true and therefore trustworthy. But I think the deepest of all is, again, back to our friendships and our relationships. People who are true can be trusted. They're trustworthy. They're faithful. So you can relax in their presence and get to know them and so on. So many of the deepest things of life assume and require truth. Mm. And, of course, the Jewish and Christian faith, God is a God of truth. His word is truth. So the Jewish and Christian faiths have the highest view of truth. And for myself, I'm exceedingly grateful because without truth, everything's power. We're in a world of manipulation. Mm, wow. That, oof, that makes total sense. So I have, even you know, if people want to go to my previous episode, I was kind of like designing a quadrant and I was saying, okay, there's, there's the, you know, a quadrant has like one, a uh, vertical line and then a horizontal line. And what I was trying to portray in the quadrant was uh, there's the line of experience and learning that is going up, but there's also a line that balances truth versus fake or false or lies. And I was thinking, wow, the more you experience and learn, but also the more you balance to false and lies, you're going to end up in the manipulation uh, quadrant, which is you either you start believing lies and somebody else manipulates you, or you have the knowledge to manipulate others with your persuasion, right? So That's an absolutely deadly world. I mean, you take the radical left today, in terms of how you fight injustice. You mm. set up a conflict of powers. There's no God. There's no truth. It's only power. So you weaponize groups, women, blacks, or whatever it is, and you set up a conflict of powers. But if there's only power, the Romans saw clearly, the only peace that you can have at the end of the day is what they called the peace of despotism. In other words, a power that can put down every other power. Now, that will be authoritarianism, China or Russia. So tr freedom requires truth. Mm. And we've got to be clear about some of the crazy ideas around today. You know, these ideas matter. They all have consequences. And without truth, there's no freedom. You think of our Lord. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is so good. And you know something about... Uh, freedom because you you grew up in China. We were talking in the other episode and you know even in your biography in the book it says you've traveled you've lived in three different continents you've met with Winston Churchill you met with Ronald Reagan I mean the list goes on and on so you know something about what goes on in the world and about truth so what is it um, I guess Yeah, like right now, you know, what, what is happening in with Russia and Ukraine. Um, how do you think the factor of truth has a role to play even in, in something like war? Well, obviously, the, you know, they talk about the fog of war mm. because lies and propaganda spread. And you think the Russians have been described as zombified because they have such an incredibly distorted view wow. given them by Putin of what's really happening. Hmm. So how can they rise up against it? Now, we have enough lies here in America. We're not as bad as they are over there, thank God. But you need truth to have freedom, to have justice, and so on. And all that's, of course, part of the biblical understanding of who God is. Hmm. Okay, so how do we move from... from So if we're in the great quest and we're moving from skepticism through reason, through even revelation, what would be, you know, if we play with the inspired emoji or the inspired word, uh, what would be one of the ideas that it's inspiring about maybe finding like the meaning of life, finding the truth, even the truth about life? 
Uh, well, Peter, put it like this. Stage two, a time for answers. You're looking at all the possible answers. And I often say that stage is comparative. There are many possible answers in the supermarket of ideas today. Mm. And I mentioned the three families earlier, Faiths. Now, the three families all give you very, very different answers. So depending on your question, I was talking earlier today with someone we were discussing, say, human dignity. As Westerners, we care about dignity. We care about human rights. How do we ground those? Do we go along with Desmond Morris, the atheist, and say we're just naked apes, animals? Do we go along with Richard Dawkins and say we're just selfish genes? Are we machines, animals, or are we made in the very image and likeness of God? You have very different answers. Now, human rights came out of the biblical understanding of the image of God in everyone. So that's incredible. We don't just think tribally. Someone can be totally un uneducated or badly handicapped or a complete stranger to us on the other side of the world. But while they're not made in my image or your image, they're still made in God's image. And so we have to treat them with the dignity like that. Now, that's a Jewish and Christian position, but it's the highest view of human dignity. It's just one example. We were talking about freedom earlier. It's a stunning fact that you cannot ground freedom in atheism. None of the great atheists give you a solid view of freedom. Bertrand Russell, B.F. Skinner, J.B. Watson, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, go on down the line. None of them give you a high view of freedom. You can't find it in the Greeks. You can't find it in the Babylonians. Everything's in our stars. You can't find it in India. Everything's in our karma. Where is it? In the biblical notion, people made in the image of God, and so on. So depending on people's questions, you look at the different answers, and they come out incredibly differently. Mm -hmm. So differences mm -hmm. make a difference. Mm. Okay, that's so good. So uh, one of the, of course, I mean, I think that the, the, even the title of the book is kind of based on this uh, idea from Socrates, right, about examining our lives. And I think, I mean, even more profound than that, it's, it's basically what the Bible is. It's an invitation to examine our lives. It's like a mirror. And so in light of that, I mean, can you just give us a little bit of light on who was Socrates as a thinker, as a questioner, and maybe, I don't know if, if there was any sort of like belief system that you're aware of that he had or something like that? Well, Socrates, you know, is the master of people like Plato and Aristotle, but his style was to get people to think by questioning and questioning and questioning and getting down below the second hand and the traditional and the customary to get people to really think for themselves. But of course, it was considered very subversive. And eventually the authorities, and they were Democrats, not oligarchs or tyrants, the Democrats executed him because mm. they considered him uh, subversive by the constant questioning to challenge people and make them think for themselves. And that famous saying, the unexamined life is not worth living, is from his final defense speech just before he's executed. Mm. Wow. So he, he was executed for asking questions. That's what you're saying? Well, in asking questions, they considered him subversive. Because okay. the questions undermine so much of the status quo and the mm. authorities of the times, and it was considered too radical. He was, quote, unsettling the minds of the young people. Wow. Okay, because in, in a sense, I feel like that's quasi what we're living, especially in the West or here in America, I would say. It's almost like this idea, what I think it's it's, this idea of we are so free, we have freedom, um, and part of the freedom is we can question anything, right? But I feel like we <laughs> we have found so much freedom, but at the same time, 
we are canceling each other, right? There's this this term that I'm sure you've heard of, and I mean, you even write in, in some of your books, cancel culture. So uh, there's this sense that, yes, we're so free, but why are we canceling each other then if we are living like the utmost freedom that the world has ever seen? Well, we, as we said, you need truth to have freedom. Mm. The radical left has no truth, only power. And so many of their ideals are actually fraud. So they talk diversity, but you always end up uniformity. They talk freedom, but they end up, as you said, canceling, and they go on down the line. In other words, it's actually the Christian, the Jewish and Christian faiths that give you the highest view of diversity. God's creation, above all of human beings, is incredibly diverse and beautiful and filled with wonder. And But equally, you have in the Bible, Jewish and Christian, a high view of truth and of freedom. You think of the Exodus, let my people go. You think of Jesus, if the Son sets you free, you will be really free. Or you think of the Apostle Paul, for freedom, Christ called us to be free. So Jews and Christians have the highest view of freedom, and a lot of the alternatives are specious. They offer a promise, but they don't deliver. Usually, they deliver the opposite. Okay, so freedom must be accompanied by truth in order to make any progress in the quest for meaning in life. Is that kind of what yeah, you're saying? No. Well, that's not in this particular book, but I have that in other books. I, you know, I was at Oxford with a great Jewish philosopher, Sir Isaiah Berlin. And he's famous for a view of freedom. Freedom has two faces, negative and positive. So negative freedom is freedom from. Nobody's free if you're under another power. It could be drugs mm -hmm. or it could be a bully. It could be an abusive husband, or it could be a tyrant like Putin. But if you're under any external power, you're not free. So freedom begins with negative freedom, freedom from. But Berlin says that's only half of freedom. And a lot of American freedom is only negative. True freedom, full freedom, is also freedom for, freedom to be. Now, if you think, if I'm called to be free to be, then I have to ask, who am I? Hmm. And to answer that one, you need truth. And that's why Berlin says, freedom assumes and requires truth. Without truth, you don't know what you're free to be, free for. So truth requires freedom. You're back again to Jesus. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hmm. Wow. Okay, so if we are walking let's just play again with my my walking through the emojis of of emoji turn let me show them to you right here again on my virtual background uh, <laughs> there you see, there you go so i think of this as an spectrum almost like an spectrum of belief and you know blasphemous i i i kind of think wow that's like the furthest away we can be from from god or even like apathy towards life then skeptical maybe like the questioning inspire maybe like that that uh finding the truth finding freedom so what would be in this great quest for meaning what would be like the most holy idea that you can think of that can make us progress in this quest for meaning well you're not looking for a holy idea And if you take, say, a time for questions, you look for answers. Then the third stage is a time for evidences. In other words, you might say, this answer is incredible. But then you have to ask, but is it true? It doesn't just look attractive or look adequate. The question, is it true? You've got to check it out. What the lawyer calls due diligence and what the uh, philosopher calls justification, what the scientist calls verification, and so on. You've got to check out whether it's true. Now, you take, say, people looking as to whether they're to accept Jesus or not. 
two of your emojis, you can read Jesus as blasphemous hmm. or divine. Because as C.S. Lewis said, you can't just read Jesus and think, what a nice man. What incredible <laughs> ethical teaching. As Lewis says, he didn't leave us that option because the same man who had this high view of love and compassion and all these good things claimed to be God. Mm. Was he a liar? Was he a madman? Now, you remember, if Jesus had said that in India, every Hindu believes we've all got a bit of God in us, the divine spark. So if Jesus had said that in India, they would have tossed him a flower and moved on down the street. You had people like that to a penny. But Jesus said it in the one nation on earth where it was blasphemous to say that. And that's why your blasphemous emoji would come in. And the Jews were outraged. How could people, how could anyone say that? It was blasphemous mm -hmm. unless... It was true. Wow. And you can see those who engage with Jesus, yes, on the surface, he was just a great prophet. No, no. He made these scandalous claims. Yes, but were they just blasphemy? What if, in fact, it was God come down, speaking as God, acting as God, showing us God, and people who thought, wow, this is blasphemous, suddenly realized, no, no, this is true. And they fell at his feet and said, my Lord and my God. So they moved, as it were, from the skeptic of the blasphemous to your emoji of the divine. <laughs> yeah, to the divine emoji. Wow, that that is a great picture of... That's exactly why I feel like I needed to use emojis. Because I feel like, in a sense, it's almost like when you're on Facebook and whatever posts, you know, somebody pu puts a picture or maybe you have... The latest, uh, the latest uh, White House video, right? Sometimes I watch, you know, the president saying whatever or the secretary. And anyways, you have all kinds of reactions because people think differently, right? Some people might might think, oh, what they are saying is not true. Therefore, I'm going to choose this emoji. And some other people are like, no, what they are saying is totally true. And I'm using this emoji. And I feel like. That raises a super interesting question because, like you said, you know, C.S. Lewis, uh, I'm just kind of like paraphrasing, but it was almost like this idea, like Jesus was, like you said, a madman, like the craziest guy in the world, or he was who he said he was. And so if he was who he said he was, like you said, he would be on the on the divine spectrum and It's just mind blowing that people can have such a difference of opinion, like such uh, almost like the pendulum swinging like so far apart, so extreme from one another when it comes to like disbeliefs. But I feel like that is that is precisely the the freedom and the choice that we have, right? So how 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 can we help people move from a uh, from a blasphemous perspective of even Jesus or the quest for life to seeing Jesus as like the complete divine? Well, Beto, we are rational. We use our minds, but we're responsible. We make choices and our choices have consequences. But the point of C.S. Lewis is that the facts only gave you certain options. You look at this incredible teacher and these bizarre things he said, was he a liar? Lewis said, no, the evidence doesn't bear out. Was he a lunatic? No. Was he a legend concocted by his followers? No. And Lewis was a great literary critic. He knew this wasn't the mark of myth and so on. Well, what other option is there? Liar? lunatic, legend, oops. <laughs> and Lewis called himself the most reluctant convert in England because it was the truth. In other words, his conclusion based on the facts that forced him to his knees. So all you want of the seeker is, is honesty. Mm -hmm. In other words, when they've got questions, you drop all the 
supercilious type of skepticism. You look at everything honestly, looking at Gautama Buddha and his search, looking at Bertrand Russell and his free man's worship and so on. You just want people who will be honest and then look at everything fairly. And if they do, I'm, you know, I'm one of those who came and I eventually said, no, the Eastern religions, not adequate. Secularism, not adequate. Christian faith, gloriously adequate, mm. and better still, true. Mm. Wow, what a what an amazing invitation and journey. And so I love how you use the word, the evidence. Like we need to, even you know when you think of like the scientific method, right? Like the the reasoning, it's all based on on the evidence, right? Like on the details. And I feel like there's almost like this, this sense of like, there's a, there's an evidence as humans that, I mean, I can point maybe to Paul in scripture saying, you know, the evidence has been there all along in Romans. Like when you look at the world, when you look at creation, there's evidence that shouts, there is uh, a creator behind all of that. There is a designer when you, we look at our own bodies, it's just so complex and amazing that it's like, wow, the, if, if you don't look at yourself and see evidence of, of creativity, of evidence of something beyond ourselves, uh, maybe we're not paying attention, right? So as we, as we move on on the exam in life, what would be, what would be like the final invitation for people to to look at themselves to really like to even think like you were saying right we won't move forward if we're not even thinking about the meaning of life so what would be in a world that it's it's kind of like shallow um so many people are just living nobody's looking to thrive like what would what is like the first uh invitation For, for us to say, hey, the, if you look at it this way, you may start seeing beyond what's just superficial. Well, you know, most people, as Socrates is right, the unexamined life not worth living. Most people, let's be blunt, don't think enough, care enough, even to start raising questions. In other words, they're leading lives not worth living, including many intellectuals in many of our universities. <laughs> so the challenge is stage one. And I often ask, and I'm thinking a lot in history and so on, why don't people think more? And you know, the two big mm -hmm. answers, one was Pascal's famous answer, people don't want to think about reality, so they surround themselves with diversions his word, busy, entertaining distractions. They've always got their headphones on. They're always into video games. And you can think of our modern world. We have so many ways of diverting ourselves so that we don't have to think at all. The other reason people don't think is what used to be called bargaining. Now, as we say, oh, yes, it's important, but later. When I've graduated from college, when, when mm. my kids are a little older, when I've paid off the mortgage, you know, when I've retired and got a bit of time to think and read. And then, of course, you get to the end of life and we still haven't started to think. And you have in, in Western literature the figure of Faust. And Faust is the man who wants more time, more knowledge, more power. So he bargains with the devil mm. and sells his soul to the devil to get a little more time. But, of course, the devil has read the small print And Faust hasn't, so time runs out. You remember the story Jesus told, and the farmer who's building bigger and bigger and bigger barns, and God says, you fool. Tonight, your soul's required of you. In other words, whether it's diversion or whether it's bargaining, a lot of people are running away from thinking, and the challenge is to love them enough to make them think, because only when you have deep meaning to life do you have a life worthy of life. Mm. So to me, that first stage, it's not the only stage, only stage one, but it's the crucial stage because so many people never even get there. Wow. Yeah. And that would be the saddest thing. And you were even mentioning uh, the life of Marlon Brando, right? You said something like at the end, he said something like, 
well, what what was that all about? Something like that. Can you um, elaborate a little bit on what was the uh, the phrase he said? You've got the book somewhere down in front of you. I haven't got the book, but it is quite a quote. Clearly, he arrived at the end and never really thought about it. And in a way, that's incredibly sad. I, I'm always grateful. In the six, I said I'm a child of the sixties where everyone was challenged to go back to square one, to know why you thought something and why you believed it and so on. So I've been fortunate to be among people all my life who are really serious about thinking, but sadly many people aren't. Mm, yeah, I, I think it was, I wrote it right here. It says, Marlon Brando said, what was that all about? That was his quote at the end of the life. What was that all about? Imagine, I mean, uh, what a sad comment, right? <laughs> Towards the end of your life. And I love how you said at the beginning, I was reading in page 35 that we, we one of the, the elements in the pursuit of, of meaning in life is wonder, right? And that's where I was saying, like, when we look at our bodies, when we look at creation, when we look at, like, the beauty of of the world, we can find wonder. So this would be a little more like a personal question, but it would be along the lines of like, what has in your life brought you uh, wonder? That sense of awe, that sense of life is worth living. Well, I have to say that because of my own background, and we think we talked about this last time, I was born in China. When the Japanese invaded in World War II, 17 million were killed. To stop them, the Chinese in the area I were in flooded the Yellow River. Without telling their people, they killed 900,000 overnight. And then when I was a small boy, we were caught in a famine in which 5 million died in three months, including my brothers. And then I lived in the capital city, Nanking, And I was there during the reign of terror for two years. And if you look at Chinese history, Mao, Mao Zedong, may have killed at least 50 million, maybe 75 million. So for me, the realism of growing up in that sort of world always left me with a sense, whatever faith I believed in had to be both realistic and hopeful. And those two things had to go together. Nothing Pollyanna-ish for me. So it wasn't for me wonder, and I know people for whom it was. Um, I, I tell a story in another book of G.K. Chesterton, you know, who went to an art college in the 1890s, nihilistic and so on. Everything was dark. He was flirting with pessimism. But he then wrote, I was stopped in my tracks by a dandelion, not by a rose or a sunset or a Mozart sonata, a simple dandelion. How do you explain the beauty of this world we're in, as well as the brokenness which humanity brings? You've got to explain both, not one or the other, but both. And that was what actually led him to his faith in Jesus. Mm. Wow. The beauty, the beauty of, of the mundane, I would say. Like the beauty mm. of the day-to-day, the, -day, the beauty... I, I, I always love to think of the things if I could take if I could take anything to heaven with me, right? Like I mean, for sure we know like you are not gonna take anything. Everything is left on earth. All your possessions or your money, whatever, it's gonna be left here. But I always tend to think, what if there are things that we can take there that I mean, for example, I, I, this is just me, right? Maybe I'm just being silly, but I think, what if the smile of a child is something I can take with me? What if my relationships with others is what I can take with me? That that sense of uh, of love, really. No, that's beautiful, but that's not silly. You take the great Jewish idea that all of us, you know, I'm not a musician like... Bach or Beethoven. I'm not an artist like Rembrandt or Michelangelo, but as the Jews say, the one thing that all of us are creating is ourselves. Mm. Lewis talks about all the little choices that make character. 
So the ultimate thing we create is ourself. And while we leave all our possessions, we take ourselves and we're the person that we have created by all our choices, good choices, bad choices, and so on and so on. So what you're saying is actually very important. The love that can smile genuinely mm. or laugh even in the face of things that are sometimes awful because we rise above it with faith, you know, that's what's making us people of character and so on. So mm. those things you do take with you. Love it. Okay, awesome. So this is how I want to end the episode. Um, I'm just thinking as you grew up in war, right, during war time in China and all the experiences you've faced in your life that, um, you know, in the other episode, you were saying that your brother died during this time. So it's almost like I, I would love for you to give almost like a like an inspiring, hopeful word to people who might be suffering right now. Even when I think, you know, we, we discuss a little bit about, you know, Russia and Ukraine. Um, as I think of people that are facing war times of their own, whether it's actual war or whether it's some other type of like war in their lives, what would be like the, uh, no, from a person that lived it, a word of advice, a word of hope. Well, a couple of thoughts, and obviously that's a very wonderful and a deep question you ask. A couple of thoughts. One is, those of us who are looking at Jesus, look at the cross. No one can go so low, whether it's pain and torture or suffering and loss, no one can go so low that God hasn't gone lower still to reach us and to show us his love. So that'd be one thing. You could explore that in much greater depth. The other thing I would say, and this went back to my boyhood, because never in all those turbulent, incredible times, um, I never saw my two parents waver in their trust in the Lord. And it was always, God is greater than all. He can be trusted in all situations. Have faith in God. Have no fear. So I'm currently reading the prophet Isaiah. You know, people in his time have what you might call the God on our side idea. So God would bless us. And if we're in trouble, he maybe wasn't God or whatever. Isaiah, no, no. God can use pagan powers like Assyria and Babylon to judge his people. He's the Lord of history, the Lord of the nations, more powerful than the superpowers. He's the sovereign Lord and can trust him. You know, in the middle of the Civil War, Lincoln wrestled with that. And after he was killed, they found a memo on his desk he'd written to himself. And it just begins, the will of God prevails. So as he points out in the second inaugural, the challenge is not to have God on our side. The challenge is for us to be on God's side and to know that everything will work out in the end. The will of God prevails, all will be well. So look at the cross and look at the sovereignty of God over history. Wow, Oz, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing and I just want to point people to to your book, to your writings. Where do you want to point people as to find more about the type of work that you do? Well, I can find anything on osguinness.com, my website. But I hope they enjoy this book, Great Quest. Awesome. Thank you so much, Oz. We'll dismiss the show right here. Thank you for listening, my friends. You guys can go to christianpodcast.com to check out more of our in-depth of our episodes. This is, I believe, episode 53. So we're still almost like, no, like a new podcast, but all of our episodes are there. You can even see the progression from our first ever episode to the ones we're doing now, all the opportunities to talk with people that we've had. It's been an amazing journey I'm super grateful for. And 
that's all for this episode. So I'll see you guys on the next one.